So how does machine learning work? This is the first question one, one can have, right? Sorry, some logistic problems. Can you see it work? Can you see it well? So how can we make a machine to learn something? And this is not only a um, technological problem, but a cognitive problem. So what is learning? Should we define what learning is? And that uh, brings new problems to us, right? Because what we usually say that machine learning is, well, I can tell you one thing. The machine learns nothing at all. So actually, the learning doesn't happen if you <laughs> considered in the strict way of the word, but it's just that the machine is now able to do some predictions, predictions based on certain information that you have provided to him. So it's, it's mainly able to repeat in a very complex level. For example, let's, let's talk about this conceptual level first. What do I have here? A dog? One dog? Three variations. Three variations of a dog? Great. So that was quite easy for him, right? What's your name? Greg. Greg? So for Greg, that was really easy. But that is really difficult for my computer to know. Why? Because if you watch the, at the first picture, you, as humans, have abstraction. So you can understand not only this figure, but the idea behind it, right? If I try, well, that will be a disaster. But if I try to draw, to, to draw the picture that I see, I see something like a ball. I see something like this. Well, this is a disaster, but this is something like what I see, right? And this could be a dog or anything else, right? But you're actually not seeing a dog, but relating this piece of information in a shape of a picture now with a concept that you already knew, right? And thanks to that, thanks to that reason, you understand that the next picture is the same thing. Because you are able to understand that this dog had a body that is not this shape, but the shape of a, of a dog. And the same thing goes for the third picture. Because you know that dogs are from a lot of different colors. Color is not a very important feature to consider when analyzing if something is a dog. Right? But the machine struggles to do this simple task. Artificial intelligence. We have talked a lot lately about this concept. And machine learning is just one tiny part of it. But artificial intelligence has been there for a long time, right? I mean, you know, 60s, 70s, there were a lot of uh, books, novels written about artificial intelligence. Why is it now that we're talking a lot about it again? Well, you could consider what I'm going to say an opinion. But I think this is true. The new paradigm is that we have a lot of data. And very fast and good ways to process it. So before, we would have problems to deliver millions of different versions of a dog to a computer for the computer to learn what a dog is with all the different possibilities that your brain know a dog is. Now we can do that easily. So that's why machine learning is being inside uh, artificial intelligence field now again, and why we're talking a lot about this uh, thing right now again. So let's see how the, this learning, this so-called learning happens. So first we need data. This is, of course, that we know. So the data is like the food for the machine in order to learn. If you don't provide data, let's say instead of data experience to the machine, it will not learn. Imagine a newborn. A newborn starts to collect data 
experiences by touching, experimenting with things, right? So at first, the newborn will not know that some things will hurt. So we have to protect him from doing it. But the experience of falling and, and experience, experiencing the pain is what prevents the newborn to do it again, right? So what we do is we get experience, so data, and then we create expectations. So I touch something that had a flame on it. I got burned. It was painful. I better don't touch a flame again, right? So that is very, very similar to what we're doing with the machine, with one difference. Without the data, the machine will forget. But you will still get the information in your head. And again, we need to go to the conceptual process because how, how does a human learn? Well, I'm not an expert on the field, but I can tell you that we learn through failing expectations. So we expect something to happen. It happens something on, on another way, the way that we didn't expect this thing to go. Therefore, there is a failure in what we expected to happen, and we learn. So the step two is very boring. It takes a long time. It's about structuring the data, cleaning the data. Not interesting right now. The third step, it's model building. OK, we just build the model. How easy is that? Uh, step four, the model will tell us something. So the model is actually the tiny brain that we have created for the machine. And this tiny brain does one task. And it fails or not, it's more accurate or not. We can talk about errors later if you want. But there is nothing else on it. So this brain will need new inputs in order to predict new outcomes, right? And these inputs will have to have the same structure as the inputs we used to fit the model. So this brain is expecting certain things in certain structure. And if we change the structure, how clever is that brain? It fails miserably to predict. So we have to fit the model with the same data that we will have to use later uh, for prediction. And the fifth point, well, you could or not agree with this point. It's not necessary for the machine learning process. But hey, what is something if it doesn't provide value? So let's extract some value from it. And as I said here, step three is not so simple. So I want to stop a tiny bit on this step. So imagine you have a certain amount of data. I'm going to draw something on the blackboard. Imagine you have a data set. Let's, let's talk in, in easy terms. So for example, you have an Excel, an Excel um, matrix, an Excel table with some columns and some rows. I'm not going to draw it. It's very boring. OK? So you have this data set or this table. And you want to create a model that, being given some of these features, is able to predict the outcome of one of the other features. Well, it's very easy. We say to the machine, OK, get, this, get all this information. Find some patterns. We will go through more detail later. Find some patterns, and then try to predict this column. So at first, the machine will look at the whole data set, will be staring at it, learning from it. And then the machine will hide itself this column, and will try to do the predictions. Okay. How can we evaluate then how the machine performed in doing so? Was the machine accurate or not? Well, this creates big problems. Why? Because if we train with all the experiences that we have at disposal, then the machine will probably be successful on foreseeing the outcome of these experiences. He has seen everything, so he will Probably it will probably predict accurately these things that he has already seen. It has already seen. In order to 
be able to evaluate what will happen with new, uh, with new instances, with new experiences, we need to save a tiny bit of, of our data set in order to create what we call a test set. So we test with data that the machine has not used to train the model, okay? So some part of my data set will be saved for testing. Which percentage and how am I going to do that varies a lot. Unfortunately, it depends on a lot of factors. How large was my primary data set is the most important factor. But also, how am I going to choose this, this test set? It's important. Imagine that I have this uh, table sorted by year. My first column, for example, is year. So here am I at 2010, and at the end, I'm I am in 2017. What will be the problem? If I create this artificial cat, I'm going to train only with successes that had happened until a time. So the new behavior will be excluded from the training, right? So we don't, we don't want that. Or yes, depends on the situation. But let's say we don't want that. We should do a random sample. But what happens if we have different proportions on the, class, on the classes that we want to, to predict. Well, we will need to do different selections. So for example, a stratified selection or whatever. So this again is very complex, but let's say we can do a random sample, okay? Now I have this training set. And the machine excludes the column I called P as prediction, and starts first looking at the whole picture, trying to create some rules, and then builds the model with the information that has here. And now we have to predict, to do the predictions to compare with the test set, and we can check if the outcomes were correct or not. So imagine my test set had, I don't know, class A, class B, class A. And the machine says, well, this will be class A, this will be class B, this will be class B. So we just made one mistake, okay? It's quite accurate. Well, it's 33% of error, which is not so, so nice, but this, this is an example, okay? Well, probably you are seeing a problem here, or more than one problem. First problem, I lose data. How boring. I don't want to lose data, if possible. Second problem, what happens with... 2018. I don't have 2018 yet. Well, I'm not a magician, so who cares? We'll train again in 2018. In any case, the problem of losing data is real. It's real. So there are methods to do estimations of error without, without losing data. The problem is that the model will not be evaluated. Let me explain it with a tiny bit more detail. So imagine I have the data set that I had before. And I want it to be all training set. All of it, so 100% training set. I have a problem. I will have to test with itself, right? As, and as I said, this can bias our, our forecasting of error because we are testing with instances that we have already used to train. Well, no problem. What I'm going to do is I'm going to train with 90% of the model. And I'm going to save 10% as a test set, OK? I'm going to build here model one. Model one with 90% of my data set, okay? And then I'm going to test here, and I will get some error results. I will say error one, okay? Now, I do the same. But I use this. 
to train and this 10% to test. So actually what I'm doing is exactly what I was doing here, but saving another part of the, of the data set. So now this other part of the data set will be the test set. Before it was a training set, now it's going to be the test set. Then I will have another model, tiny bit different, and my error metrics will be different. Well, you already did the maths, right? If I do this 10 times, my whole data set would have been creating models, and my whole data set has been uh, tested, has been tested, okay? So let's say that at the end, I will expect that the summatory of the errors will give me the mean of the errors of all the tiny models that I created, and we say that we expect this model to have these error metrics. Got it? Quite simple. But still, we must validate these expectations on what we call validation set, so a new set. And this validate, validation set needs to have new experiences as different as possible from the experiences that we used to train. So if we go back to the doc, imagine that I have a data set built with the first two pictures and some other animals. And my classifier is finding the dogs and it's telling me it's very accurate. But now in the validation set, I have the third picture as well because a funny guy added it to a data set. And now my model fails miserably and says this is a cat. Okay, so the problem is that as we didn't have different colors on the dogs, the classifier didn't understand that he has to look at the color as a, good, as a, as a way to identify uh, an animal, and that's a problem. Okay, let's move on. So predictions, I'm talking about predicting a class all the time. So classification is to classify something that is non-numeric into different bins, different boxes. So for example, I have a data set with parachuters, as weird as it looks, uh, tennis balls and dogs again. And I want to classify uh, these data points in these categories. So the problem is that I can't numerically operate with them. So two parachuters plus one ball is two parachuters with and one ball. I can do any mathematical operation. While on regression, you probably see this graph, saw this graph already a lot of times and you hate it. Um, on regression, my data can be of any numeric variable, numeric value possible. So, and you have an infinite amount of um, values to, 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 to become. So that creates a problem. How do I measure the error? Imagine, in this situation, I try to classify, and I've added one ball to the parachuters box. So I count how many misplaced items were in the boxes, and I know that I've made one mistake out of, I don't know, 10. So I have a 10% of misclassified instances or a 10% of error, right? But how do I deal with this here? Because I can predict that, I don't know, a car costs 30,000 30, euros and it costs 29,500. Am I accurate or not? What do you think? I'm quite accurate, right? So in, in, this case, in this case, I can't measure the error in terms of being correct or not because that will be very depressing. It's very difficult to be exactly correct with a number, right? Instead, I will need to use different metrics, okay? If you want to talk about metrics of error, we can do it later because there is a lot of stuff and we can go back, okay? So I'm talking a lot about building a model, building a model, but I have not said yet 
how to build a model, how a model is built, right? So there is this magic word, which is the algorithm, also called black box, also called no one knows what happens inside. Because <laughs> if someone tells you that they know, they don't. <laughs> I mean, it's possible that you have created some algorithms, okay, then you probably know it, but you are one out of one million, and it's nice. I will, I will be glad to meet you. There is another possibility. You have tuned a model, which is, I had an algorithm made by a genius. I tried to understand how it works, and I changed some parameters. Well, you have not done an algorithm. You have just to did a tiny bit to adapt this method to your data set. So be skeptical about creating algorithms, and when you hear this word or companies that say, we create your algorithm, bullshit. I have to say it because it happens a lot, um, and it disappoints me a tiny bit, as you probably saw. So what we do mainly is to choose models that have been built by clever people through a lot of time, through a lot of time, and usually they have a lot of years because neural networks, 21th century, bullshit. On the 60s, they were already developed. Super vector machine, the future, 70s, in the 70s, it was already designed. Not used until the 90s, because the Russians are a tiny bit crazy. They had this genius inside their country, and they said, well, talk to a wall. We don't care about what you say. Then the Americans said, come. We are going to use your algorithm, they, and they succeed using it. So as you can see, what has changed is the possibility of using these algorithms, these methods, with a lot of data. And all the methods I'm talking about are non-parametric algorithms. Let's go into this point. So parametric algorithms, the thing that you hate. Me too. So these algorithms are functions that we already know their shape. So for example, linear regression. Sorry to use the blackboard, but I thought it was better than creating infinite amount of slides. So. Imagine I have, a, I don't know, two variables. Let's say something that is easy to, to interpret. For example, uh, let's say salary, age. Let's imagine, let's imagine that our data points have this shape. I'm very optimistic for the elders, but So let's change, because like this, I don't know how to, how to see it. So H, salary. OK, so the older someone gets, it looks like the more revenue is, is getting, right? So now I can tell you exactly how much money this guy is earning. And this guy is, I don't know, 18, and, a, and earning. 10k euros. He lives in Barcelona, clearly. Um, I can tell you exactly how this guy, how much money this guy earns. And I can tell you exactly the same for this guy. Let's say it's 15. And this guy is 22. What happens with the guys in the middle? So we need to choose a way to be able to represent any point on, of this space, right? So I go a tiny bit far away. I choose a line, and I try to draw it. Boom. So I failed miserably in some points, right? So now the problem is that for some points, I'm quite accurate. But for, for some others, I'm not. But hey, I'm more intelligent than only um, straight lines. Let's choose another function. I can try to use a, something like an exponential function. Hey, this time I had better success. Why? Because I took a second look at the data, right? So the idea is to choose, to choose a function that has a known shape. So for example, here I added the, the formula of the linear function with a slope and a constant. We can choose any other function that we know. And then the good thing 
is that this coefficient, so a and k, are going to be defined by the machine. I'm not going to find these parameters. Because if not, why are we using machines? So parametric methods will be good then when you already know the behavior of something, right? For example, how many of you have worked with parabolic movements in high school? Well, we know that if I throw this thing like this, it will have a certain movement, right? I know it, that's why I can aim, actually, because if I didn't know this function, I will not be able to aim. So again, knowing this function has nothing to do with the knowledge of mathematics. It's experience, okay? So I can fail. For example, if I try to hit Gerard from here, it's possible that I, <laughs> that I fail because the parameters are not going to be perfectly chosen. What do I have to do in order to aim him quite accurately? Throw some pens. So have some data, not only one, but not that much. With a few trials, I'm going to hit him. Do you have more pens? <laughs> so the, that's the idea, OK? So it's, not the be, it's not the best way to build a model, especially now that we can deal with large, with large data sets. But if we don't have a lot of data, but we so not a lot of pens, not a lot of trials, but we know something about the, the field, so we have some expertise, that's the algorithm to choose. Non-parametric algorithms. So this time I'm not going to think I'm clever. I'm the clever cookie who knows to draw lines. And I'm going to think that the, machines, that the machine knows better. Now I'm going to find a method that uses a way of thinking that makes sense for my data. But I'm not going to choose a function or a predefined line. OK? That is the main difference. In order to do that, I just need more data. Why? Because if we, if we collect few data points, they can have artificial shape. For example, here I collected only 12 or 13 data points. But what happens if I collect more, I'm sorry that, but there is a certain point that the people is, stops earning more. So, hey, I didn't know that before. I didn't have enough data. So I collect as much data as I can. Actually, I stop doing samples, thanks God, and I can work with all the data that I have in order to find the function that suits best, best the shape of the data points. Also, it's easier for our brains to deal with a higher dimension problem if we use this kind of methods. Because here, the regression was quite simple, right? I have two possibility, two variables. But what happens if I have 10 variables? So what happens when I have a multi-dimensional space? Well, my brain starts to get exhausted, and it's really difficult to think on this space. I mean, think about four dimensions. So non-parametric algorithms will help us in finding patterns and shapes in forms that we don't even understand. So here you have a um, tiny chart comparing both methods, OK? I said almost everything, but it's good to go through them. So parametric algorithms, more simple to understand, uh, faster to build, of course. And you can work with the small data sets. Working with the small data sets seems not beneficial. But hey, if you are doing experiments, you are probably happy not to test on 1,000 humans. You can test in 100 only. Limitations, yeah, of course, they are constrained by the shape. So even I know, even I know that here, I should do this again, and probably here I should do this too. I can't. I, I chose a function, and I go with it until the end. So simplicity, yeah. They are a tiny bit simplistic, I would say. And also, poor fit. What does poor fit mean? It means, again, the same, that I know that there are some errors here, some distances from the expected value to the real value. 
and I can do nothing about it. Non-parametric algorithms, benefits. They are more flexible, as I already said. The performance, then, is better, because I can adapt better to my data points. Limitations, they require more data to learn the shapes, because if not, they will do movements that are completely arbitrary, and they will fail. Computational power, of course, to deal with these large data sets, I need more powerful computers. And finally, risk of overfitting. The demo came already. So overfitting, for those who are not familiar with the term, happens when we try to, uh, to adapt the function so it goes through the whole data points, so to all the data points. So let's imagine this function. Let's say same, same problem. If I do this, I have a high risk of biasing the model because this guy was probably an outlier, uh, not normal behavior. Right? So trying to go through all the data points with the function is dangerous because new experiences will not be explained good. It, they will be explained by the coincidence of the data points that we had before. So trying to push and turn the model, the model until the end will create great performances when we test with our train set, but they will fail when we go to predict new cases. Okay, so this would be overfit. This would be underfit, like, hey, you could have done better. And this will be like in between a tuned fit or something like that. Questions? Uh, when you talk about non-parametric algorithms, are you referring to non-parametric statistics also? Because I know that, for example, the Spearman correlation is a non-parametric version of the other kind of correlations. And uh, I'm not sure whether this limitation of more data is applies also. So pa pa parameters exist in both, uh, in both models. It's just that some of them are def predefined. So in parametric algorithms, you define the parameters. And then the algorithm chooses the components. So for example, on the linear, on the linear function, you define that there will be an x and there, uh, that there will be a constant. And of course, that the constant can be 0. Yeah. Then the model will define the coefficient. So the slope, for example or how, the, how much this constant is. In this case, the parameters exist, but you do not define them. You do not give it to the machine. So you don't know if you are going to find an exponential function, logarithmic function, or whatever function you can imagine, or a very, very complex polynomial, which is where you get the danger of getting overfitting. I don't know if, I, if it answers the... Yeah, but the question is then, uh, do you think Spearman correlation as a non-parametric statistical uh, method um, also requires a big uh, data set? Yeah, would, I would say so. Yeah. 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 So it is a non-parametric way, and it will require a, a, a bigger data set. The yeah. question is, is that sometimes, from an exploratory point of view, perhaps yeah. it's, a, it's a difference. Uh, small data set is enough, at least for identifying trends. You know? So it, it, which kind of data set, like uh, belonging to what realm? Yeah, we, work, we work, for example, in healthcare. Uh, OK. Let me, tell you, let me tell you one thing. So uh, human behavior is really changing, right? But um, healthcare, actually, so he the health of a human is something that can be predicted easily, let's say because the components are known to us. So that's why you can perform better, because actually the, the functions are kind of simple, right? So for example, let's say, if you want to know if someone has diabetes, 
with certain uh, variables, not a lot of them, you will be able to know, right? So the components can be reduced. It's like having principal, principal component analysis already done to your data set. Where, whereas other kind of behavior, like for example, clicks on a website, they have a lot of different reasons, right? And it's, it's more difficult to, to know. Imagine I, I, I go to another dimension of a space and I throw an, an object. The, the behavior will be unexpected. I don't know if, what's the gravity. I don't know if it will go higher, lower, or what will happen. But once I identify it, it will, for, it will be a physical function. So the, there are some limits on how complex can this be, right? That would be the, the, the point. Why will you have a normal distribution all the time? No. You will have the distribution that this problem has, but it can be bimodal or or non or non uh, normal or whatever shape. Actually, dealing with dealing with huge data sets and distributions is another topic we could talk about. But let me just say a tiny bit of it. Imagine you have, so you already know what a classification method is, okay? Imagine I want to know the sentiment of the brand Apple. Okay, can you, Im so imagine, I go to the website, do I have time? Yeah. Um, I go to the website, I collect data from different websites, and I get this distribution. What's happening here? What's happening is that in the 98% of the cases, those websites don't talk about iPhone, right? So, does it? Can you say that again? Yeah. So, I. Okay, this is sentiment. This is positive and this is negative. Okay? And I have this distribution of the data. So I have some people here, few people here, a lot of websites here, and the same, let's say it's symmetric, okay? It will not be symmetric because Apple has a better um, sentiment than worse. But let's say it's symmetrical for... for thinking reasons. The first problem I have is that I have a lot of data points on the zero, and I have to recognize that it doesn't mean neutral sentiment, but it means absence of sentiment, right? Because imagine I create five categories. I say, hey, this is um, a numeric variable that has not a lot of sense in numeric terms, because 20 points of sentiment minus 17 points of sentiment, I prefer to count people who like or not this brand, okay? And I say, okay, you have the lovers, you have the mm, positives, you have the neutrals, you have the negatives, and you have the haters. <laughs> if I classify, and the method I would, I would use to classify this is, the, is this one that I will talk about in one minute if Sindre lets me. The method I will choose is, is a decision tree, for example. I like vertical lines. So here I have a problem. Imagine I do this, and my classifier tells me, hey, I'm 98% correct. Eureka. Well, what the algorithm is doing is, I know 98% of the points are here, so I put the 100 data points in this column. I'm so clever, I almost don't fail. That's stupid, right? That's why we have Kappa statistics, which in this case will be zero. For those who don't know Kappa statistics, believe that it's the success that is not depending on um, azar, uh, on, on chance, yeah, on luck. So if the algorithm is so clever that says, hey, I'm going to put all the people here because the majority of the people is here, of course, 
he is succeeding because of chance, of probability, of distribution. So the first thing I would have to do is to erase this distribution. And if I want to still identify neutral sentiment, kind of stratify my sample. So I have an artificial distribution because non-parametric algorithms don't deal with distributions, actually. They don't care. So I was talking about a decision tree, so CIP, um, classification method. It's called uh, C5.0. And this is the, the outcome that the machine will provide. So it creates a tree. Difficult to imagine like this. Better to imagine it like this. But it creates a tree where the branches are logic decisions. So somehow, what, it's, what, the, what the algorithm is doing is to do a grid on the data set. Because the rules are uh, parallel to the, uh, to the axis. And we find finally leaves, which are like tiny clusters, if I may say this word. Um, so tiny groups of, of data points that behave similar and are classified together. So also, it's a good way to examine our, um, our data set. And that's why this model is not only used for prediction, uh, for prediction reasons, but also for data mining or uh, understanding the data reasons. It works very good with uh, two, two possible outcomes, by the way. So zeros or ones, as I was saying, with the paid or not paid. I use this because of that reason. And it works very good with multi-dimension problems because it simplifies into the main, um, into the main um, logic nodes. So imagine I had a data set of customers. Um, it will take, for example, um, let's say the region and the amount and the age as important features use them to build the nodes in order to get to the leaves. So every leaf will be a combination of these uh, features, for example. And also it will discard other uh, branches. So some possible leaves will fail, will fall, sorry, because it doesn't need them to provide us the best success possible. So your question was about that, actually. The, the problem here with the 98 distribution is that all the, all the um, categories fall because he succeeds more by putting everyone in the same bin. This is a neighbor's algorithm. It's called neighbor's algorithm because it compares you with the data points that you have around you, okay? So imagine, let's find a problem. Okay, imagine um, you are this data point you are this data point, and we want to know if you are red or blue. So, for example, if you like mm, pineapple pizza or not. And actually, well, you probably know if you like pineapple pizza or not. Don't tell us. So, the, this guy, imagine, is a guy who likes pineapple pizza, okay? So, if we compare you to the guy that you have next to you, we will say, you like pineapple pizza, so we will classify you as a red dot, okay? But this is not very democratic, actually. This is very authoritarian. So what we do is we choose a different amount of neighbors in order to, co to compare you with some other data points and to be able to contrast if there is, um, if there is a, all, only one possibility or two possibilities that we have to count. We will do this mathematically with Euclidean distances to these points. But it's easy to understand it with this circle. So if I, get the, if I get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven data points instead of one, the outcome will be the opposite. Because now you have five guys who don't like pizza with pineapple next to you. Okay, so the number of neighbors that you choose is critical to the success of, the, of, of this method. How lucky we are that machines do this for us again, because they iterate, they iterate until they find, until they find uh, the best number of neighbors possible, okay? Um, 
what would be a good use case for, for this one when you have, um, when you have behavior based on similar uh, characteristics? It's both used for regression and classification, but it works better in my experience for classification than for regression. It, it, it works better when trying to know if this data point is blue or red, rather than to know the distance to a certain, a certain uh, position. And finally, super vector machine, which is the most, the most complex of the ones I present to you now. Um, in this case, what we do is we try to find a position, uh, a position of the, of the space that creates, that, that creates a, a division of the data points in different sites, in different zones. And then what we do is we create a hyperplane or a, it, it can be only a two-dimension plane if we are in a three-dimension space. And super vectors, which, has, which are these lines. And actually the problematic of this method is to optimize the function that creates the hyperplanes in order for these hyperplanes to be at the maximum distance Sorry, the vectors, the super vectors, to be at the maximum distance to the upper plane. Sorry, could you repeat that all again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and symmetrically to the both classes. So let's start from the beginning, but from the, from the tail. I have two classes. One is on the left side, and the other one is at the right side. What I do now is I try to find, I try to, wait, I have an idea. Oops, that was a really bad idea. <laughs> Hopefully it's okay if I... <laughs> okay, sorry. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm a slow thinker. <laughs> so, yeah. so, yeah. so the idea is I try to find the, the two data points that are uh, mm, the most close, close to each other. And I do something like this. I find the, the um, point in between, but now I do, I do not draw a, a perpendicular line, but I find another line that is not perpendicular to this vector, but to these and these other vectors, okay? And then I draw this line. And I have to draw this line, which, where, where is where the upper plane is going to divide the, the spaces, Optimizing this function, so in order that this vector has the, the smallest uh, module, it's set in English, I don't know. Better now? Of course, there is the possibility of having a, a circle here. If not, the method would be perfect. But the good thing is that it has this so set kernel trick that what it does is to ch it checks the, the, the space in order to see a position of the space that will make this data have sense. So it, it can rotate the space in order to find a position where this is visible, okay? Okay. So I think that was it. As I said, do not be afraid of the learning of the computers. But the problem is that even though they don't learn, they have taken already over the world. So that was it from my, from my side. I hope you, you got to know some things that you um, wanted to know by coming here. And as, as this is a very wide uh, topic, I missed a lot of algorithms like uh, probabilistic algorithms, so Bayesian algorithms, or Random forest, which is a very lazy way of building models because random forest will create a lot of decision trees for you. So if you don't know what algorithm to choose, choose random forest. That's why <laughs> if you didn't go through it. But you know, there are a lot of methods right now and it's a really, really wide uh, topic. I would have loved to talk about how to evaluate errors on the classifier, not only by these row proportions, but I don't think I had time to do that. So let's hope I come here a third time. <laughs> sure. Very good. Uh, let's give it up for Jason.
Thank you.